So I'm standing just at the base of Lovelock Cave, Nevada, 20 or so miles from the town of Lovelock on the edge of the Humboldt Sink, the huge lake that was here many thousands of years ago. And this is a legendary place. This is, we feature this in Giants on Record, co-authored with Jim Vieira. Um, could, because red-haired cannibal giants are supposed to have been found here uh, when they were digging for guano in 1911 onwards, they found all these artifacts and duck decoys, many amazing tens of thousands of artifacts that were used by what are called the Saiti Ka, which translates as the Tule Eaters, which is this kind of, kind of read here. But my archaeologist friend, um, uh, Bill Snodgrass, who works at Lovelock Museum, said it might be thigh eaters, and this means cannibalistic kind of stuff going on here. So that was the name given to them by the Paiute tribe who were prominent in this area, obviously much later than the Lovelock culture. The Lovelock culture potentially goes back 10,000 years, but officially from about 2000 BC, whereas Paiutes were much, much later. Um, but they're the ones that recorded the history of this amazing place. We've got like an information board behind us, so you can, you can see what's on there uh, on the video. And also, um, there's a few other things around here we're going to look at. We're going to get some nice aerial photography to get a sense of the landscape that these potential giants were living in. So this is the main sign here. It just gives you a basic outline of what was going on, basically. Uh, they, they think yeah, they think it's probably 2600 BC up until the mid 1800s that the cave was in use. Um, but it wasn't until 1911, although actually it was recorded in the late 1800s that there were discoveries here. So it's not just in 1911 onwards. And these are the hills here and it's just the other side of this rocky peak here. That we're gonna walk around and climb up to the entrance to Lovelock Cave. But you can see the view is quite remarkable. And this would have all been filled with water. There's some water here filled with reeds and water and ducks, and many other wild fowl and fish. And that was the prominent way these so-called red-haired cannibalistic giants called the Saiti Car actually survived. So just walking up around the edge here, they've kind of created this pathway And that's it, right up the top there. You can see, just start to see the entrance to the cave. The first entrance you come into. Wow. So you can see the cave goes all the way down there and much further below down there. It's huge and up there as well. So this is just the first part of the cave and you can see, you can smell the guano in here actually. Wow, he goes far down there and all the way through there. So we just walked up from over in that direction. You can kind of get into the cave just down there, but there's an information board here. You know, it gives you a bit of information about, you know, the excavation that they say began in 1912. It was properly excavated by Llewellyn Loud uh, from 1924 with archeologist Mark Harrington. They excavated 40 storage pits inside the cave and one of them they found all the duck decoys thousands of them also fishing gear bark sandals huge moccasins shell beads 
even the wooden grasshopper we saw at the museum, 20,000 artifacts were discovered. Many of the storage pits are really interesting. They were kind of different levels. They, they, this is where they kept all the artifacts, the decoys and other such things, and the sandals. They were covered with grass and then with stone. And because they were all at different levels, completely engulfed by guano, which is like bat dung, which you can kind of smell here already, it means they could date the area here. And they got the earliest date they officially got was 2600 BC. So let's head down into the main part of the cave here. You can see they built a modern platform in here so people can actually get inside and have a good look. So, wow, you can actually see the burn marks here of where they probably smoked out the giants according to peyote tradition. Wow, this is amazing. These are what's left of the evidence of when the Paiutes and other tribes burnt out the entrance to sort of wash out all the giants and kill them. So we have actual evidence and you can see here, so the tradition is true. Wow, so this is Lovelock Cave here in Nevada, just 20 miles away from the town of Lovelock. Imagine, you know, 10,000 or 8,000 years ago. Giants were potentially living here. This is the lower part of the cave down here. That's what we looked in on the way up. And it probably would have gone deeper, but the, the massive amounts of wind and rain and even water coming up to this entrance from the lake would have filled this up with mud, dust, and obviously bat guano. So there may be more layers. This is where all the pits were found. Deep inside the cave down there was where the mummies were found. And this just shows you, you know, it looks like they may have even carved it out slightly. It's not just natural. So it was in this cave where all the Saiti car or the cannibalistic giants hid out when the Paiute and other local tribes had, had enough of them. They decided to exterminate them one by one and eventually you know, by shooting them with arrows. Eventually they all came to hide in here. And tradition states that they set fire to the entrance where I'm standing now, with all the reeds and bush and everything. Smoked them out and they all died. But the thing is, all the bodies that were found in here were properly mummified, or most of them anyway, some weren't. So it's like, you know, 120 feet wide, 30 feet deep. It looks like it's pretty much blocked any further down there. I can't really see any evidence of ancient carvings in here, although we know they did do this kind of thing in Winnemucca. All the artifacts have now been taken out of the cave. Most of them are in the Smithsonian. Some are on display in the Lovelock Marsden House Museum. Some are in Humboldt Museum. Hopefully we're going to see some in Carson City and uh, Reno museums and historical societies as well. So we're just standing at the famous entrance to Lovelock Cave. You can see it behind me. So I'm just going to contemplate for a moment. And let's take a look at what this actually looks like from the air because I want to see this in its context. Imagine this entire area, this, all this area below us is full of water and reeds. And let's get a sense of the landscape here that these ancient giants used to live in. So let's take a little walk around the other side of the cave here. See if there's anything of interest. 
you see there's little gaps in the rock. There's obviously the main entrance there. Let's take a little walk down here. Keep an eye out for snakes, of course, <laughs> and tarantulas. And it goes all the way around there and down there. So this whole area just down here, this is where it would have been, the water would have come up to here. It would have been full of reeds. And there's even a story you can see all over there as well. The reeds and the water. There's a story that the Paiutes went before they kind of banished the giants of the red-haired cannibals to the cave. They burnt all the reeds across the whole lake. So they would just end up living in caves because they'd apparently come from the south, these giants, and made up residence here and they were taking all the different, you know, sources, survival sources, the foods and other such things, as well as eating the local people. So they kind of, you know, slowly tried to wipe them out, but it was like a war that went on for a very long time. This is just an amazing cave. I mean, look at this. Makes you wonder if they've actually like burrowed in here and actually made it bigger. You've got a really good view facing kind of west. And it would have, the whole, this would have been full of water. Absolutely amazing. Amazingly, no one else has arrived here the whole time. I've been here for like two or three hours. No one is anywhere near me. I'm probably like 20 miles from the nearest human being. Look, that's the road all down there. Have to come up here and park around the back. And look at that view of Lovelock Cave. Isn't that something? That is absolutely stunning. But it's just up here. That there's something I want to check out. There's a signpost up here. I'm not sure what it is, whether it's just describing the view. Let's go and find out. Right, they're calling this a prehistoric shopping mall because you've got chub, fish, goose, rice grass, cattails, desert hare, pine nuts, especially, all in this entire area around Lovelock Cave. It's just amazing to consider that this, there was such amazing stories going on here with these cannibalistic, red-haired um, potential giants, the Paiute tribe, a great long war that went on between some tribes, including the Paiutes and the so-called giants. The fact that they were recorded as being able to kill people just by looking at them, that is, that's like a sorcerer. And this is like, these are traditions of sorcery and high magic that we find in the Ohio Valley, which we're gonna be heading to in the next week or two to look for more giant evidence. But the fact that you've got that kind of sorcery, that kind of magic going on in this area is really interesting, especially if it's like several thousand years BC. And just imagine, you know, like six to 11 foot potentially giants living here, just existing in this area. And you can just imagine there's more caves here that have been that have kind of fallen down, that have been covered up. I bet you there's more to be discovered. There's more skeletons, there's more skulls. Even in the lake behind me over there, I guarantee with the burials, the type of burials that the, uh, the red-haired Saiti car were doing, more will be discovered. And so, just amazing to be here, to be in this legendary place, which has like helped rewrite American history, but also is one of the key arguments for giants existing here in North America. You know, there's some interesting legends here, you know. I mean, I'm just gonna read you something from our book, Giants on Record. But there are legends here, not just the Sarah Winner Mucker Hopkins legends, which she talks about in her book, Life Among the Paiutes. There's other ones. There's, uh, this is an interesting one, it features in the book. And all over North America, we have similar stories of like cannibalistic giants who weren't necessarily Native American. But there was once a giant called Snahaha who killed people just by looking at them. He carried a large basket full of thorns on his back. And when he caught someone, he would throw them in the basket with the thorns. Some Indians were playing a game in a house and were having fun. They had stationed a woman outside to watch for the giant. She heard him coming. He was talking and singing to himself. 
She tried to warn people that he was coming, but they did not hear her. Snehaha was getting closer and the woman became frightened and jumped into a pit and pulled a basket over herself. The giant came up to the house and looked around. He made a sucking noise and when he looked at anyone in the house, they died instantly. The others would see the dead staring and ask what they were looking at. But they, then they too saw the giant and also died. And only the baby that was left sleeping survived. It was almost daylight and the baby was crying. And the woman left the pit and went into the house but did not look at the dead. She called to the baby and took baby away and set the house on fire. Another giant came along called Puwihi and picked up the baby. He held her head between his second and third fingers and carried him to the woman. He asked where she was from and she answered that she was from the house over there, the one that had smoke pouring out of it. There were many people in it. The giant turned towards the house and the woman was frightened and hid. When the giant returned and could not see her, he became angry. He found a way she had jumped away from her tracks and found her under a rock crying. It was too dark to see and he decided to come back in the morning. He thought he would make a fire and grind up the baby. He found a large rock and ground up the baby and ate the baby. He lay there singing and after a while he went to sleep. The woman got up and made another jump towards the east to her aunt's house. She was safe at her aunt's house and the giant could not see the mark of her stick from where she jumped because she had jumped from a rock. The woman became the ancestor of all Paiute Indians. So even in the creation stories of the Paiutes, who dominated this huge area around here, going all the way to California, Idaho, Nevada, and beyond. The original story, according to what we found here, came from this legend, and it relates to giants who could kill people just by looking at them. And they were cannibals, of course. There was another legend reported in 1891, and I quote, an Indian of giant stature who gave them trouble they say that a giant warrior came from the north. He took up his abode near Pyramid Lake and, and made war on the Paiutes, killing many of their men. The giant was finally slain by Paiute David, who crept up behind him and drove a poisoned arrow into his back between the shoulder blades. So this is kind of very interesting because we're getting traditions which are beyond, you know, what are known about, you know, classically like the Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins stories, actual earlier legends recorded long before Lovelock Cave was even known about. This, it would be another 20 or 30 years before this was even discovered. The most important and most relevant really uh, story that was written down was by Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins in uh, 1882. She was the daughter of a great chief, but she was also an activist and fought for women's rights and other such things and became kind of legendary partly because of that. But she also talked about giants and or more, more accurately, tall red-haired cannibals who were around this area where we're right now in Lovelock Cave. I'm gonna read a little parts of it here which are relevant. Um, among the traditions of our people is one of a small tribe of barbarians who used to live along the Humboldt River. It was many hundreds of years ago. They used to waylay my people and kill and eat them. They would dig large holes in our trails at night. And if any of our people traveled at night, which they did, for they were afraid of these barbarous people, they would often fall into these holes. The tribe would even eat their own dead. Yes, they would even come up and dig up our dead after they were buried and would carry them off and eat them. Now and then they would come and make war on my people. They would fight and as fast as they killed one another on either side, the women would carry off those who were killed. My people say they were very brave. When they were fighting, they would jump in the air after the arrows that went over their heads and shoot the same arrows back again. My people took some of them into their families, but they could not make them like themselves. So at last, they made war on them. This war lasted a long time. The number was about 2,600, 2,600. The war lasted some three years. My people killed them in great numbers, and what few were left went into the thick bush. My people set the bush on fire. This was right above Humboldt Lake. Then they went to work and made tule or bulrush boats and went into Humboldt Lake. They could not live there very long without the fire. 
They were nearly starving. My people were watching them all around the lake and would kill them as fast as they could come on land. At last one night, they all landed on the east side of the lake and went into a cave near the mountains. It was a most horrible place where my people watched at the mouth of the cave and would kill them as they came out to get water. My people would ask them if they would be like us and not eat people like coyotes or beasts. They talked the same language, but they would never give up. At last my people were tired and they went to work and gathered wood and began to fill up the mouth of the cave, this cave here. Then the poor fools began to pull the wood inside the cave until it was full. At last my people set it on fire. At the same time they cried out to them, will you give up and be like men and not eat people like beasts? Say quick, we will put out the fire. No answer came from them. My people said they thought the cave must be very deep or far into the mountain. They had never seen the cave nor known it was here until then. They called out to them as loud as they could, will you give up, say so, or you will all die. But no answer came. They all left the place. In ten days, some went back to see if the fire had gone out. They went back to my third or fifth great-grandfather and told him they must all be dead. There was such a horrible smell. The tribe were called people eaters. And after my people had killed them all, the people around us called us Seidukara or Saitika. It means conqueror. It also means enemy. There are actual other translations here. So, you know, the passage we just read to start with was from Sarah Winnemucker Hopkins. But there are other stories that they were thought to be called flesh eaters, but um, the archaeologist who's the curator at Lovelock Museum, uh, Bill Snodgrass, said it could also mean thigh eaters, or more famously, it's tula eaters, which is the type of um, um, reed that used to grow all around this area. But interestingly, Hopkins continued and, and seemed to have evidence they really did exist. I quote, My people say that the tribe we exterminated had reddish hair. I've, I have some of the hair which has been handed down from father to son. I have a dress which has been in our family of great many years trimmed with the reddish hair. I'm going to wear it sometime when I lecture. It's called a mourning dress and no one has such a dress but my family. So, there is traditions of these red-haired giants. So whether you know it's like the way when people die and this kind of heat, this kind of um, climate turns the hair red after a while, this has been the case. It could be the case, but I'm not so sure because there's many traditions of these live red-haired giants. But anyway, 1904, 22 years after the publication of our book, a very large skeleton was reported. And I'm just going to cover what we've put in the book here and add some things afterwards because it's really interesting. The, the headline was Bones of a Giant Are Dug Up, the Evening News, January the 14th, 1904, page 8. And it's talked about Winnemucca, Nevada, but this whole area was kind of called Winnemucca, so even the lake here as well. I'll just read this to you because it's really interesting. Workmen engaged in digging gravel here uncovered at a depth of about 12 feet a lot of bones that once belonged to a gigantic human being. Joseph Rugon, who was in charge of the work, examined the bones and at once decided that they were those of a man or a woman. It's pretty likely. They were taken to Dr. Samuels, who examined them thoroughly and pronounced them to be the bones of a man who must have been nearly 11 feet in height. The metacarpal bone measures four and a half inches in length and are large in proportion. A part of the ulna was found, which in complete form would have been between 17 and 18 inches in length. The remaining part of the skeleton is being searched for. So we have a very early report before Lovelock Cave was discovered of an 11 foot tall giant. However, in October 1936, the Nevada State Journal amended the size of the 11 foot discovery and I quote, many stories credited it with being 11 feet tall. The truth is that the figure, still with reddish hair on the skull, was nine and a half feet in length. So we're still talking about nine and a half feet tall red-haired giants from this area we're in now. So whatever anyone says, and we get a lot of this when I was in Humboldt Museum, and also, um, and even talking with uh, Bill Snodgrass, they, haven't found, they said there's no evidence of giants here, just quite tall, maybe six foot tall people, I'm not so sure. And even, you know, the Smithsonian got involved and that particular skeleton was sent to them um, and never seen again, obviously. But it was in 1911 that this cave 
kind of got discovered by guano businessmen who were digging here. But they started finding artifacts, a lot of them, and over 20,000 artifacts were eventually found. And they called in different archaeologists um, from the state to come and do research here. But similar artifacts were found in a nearby hidden cave, and these have been dated to 9,000 years old. Spirit Cave is famous for the mummy, uh, which has now been um, pretty much been debated by the local tribes as to whether it should be repatriated. But that's 9,400 years old, which is contemporary with Kennewick Man of a similar age. But you know, the, o o the very oldest evidence we're finding here is 2,740 BC with some carbon dating that was carried out. Anyway, it was James Hart and David Pugh who got the rights to dig and sell the guano at Lovelock Cave in 1911. And about when they were got quite, you know, just a few feet into the cave, I quote, they found a striking looking body of a man six feet six inches tall. His body was mummified and his hair distinctly red. So we have that again. And then we have the story of the Fraternal Lodge who, um, <laughs> I quote, the best specimens of the adult mummies was boiled and destroyed by a local fraternal lodge which wanted the skeleton for initiation purposes. And this could be the Fallon Fraternal Society, which we think it is, but my buddy Bill from Lovelock Museum thinks it could be the Institute of Oddfellows, who we know um, are quite unorthodox and, and would possibly do things like this. But even in 1978, it was excused that these giants even existed claiming uh, that you know, this is the Nevada State Historical Society who said none of the institutions had any knowledge of the red-haired people's remains, even though some were sent to the Smithsonian. Another account uh, was announced in 1975 of a man well over six and a half feet tall. This could have been the one that was in the possession of uh, Clarence Stoker, who's also donated many of the artifacts and discovered many that are in the Lovelock Museum and other museums. Um, there was, there was another account between six and seven foot tall in the 1960s, which could be the same one. There's also a four inch donut shaped stone, which we saw some of those in the museum, with 365 dots on the outside and 52 dots on the inside, suggesting they had an understanding, whoever was here and however old this particular stone was, of very detailed annual calendar. Other skulls were discovered um, that were actually on display, po possibly the ones from Clarence Stoker. There were four skulls on display. I, I asked them and they've been repatriated. I think they're now in the museum in Reno, awaiting repatriation. We're gonna investigate, see if we can get access to them, but we know they're not particularly giant, but they're robust, almost Cro-Magnon type skulls, which shouldn't really be here in this area officially. Um, and there's, there's a lot of debate about, you know, who really these people were. But the jaws were very large, and even Micah Ewers, who's you know, a well-known giantologist who did some research here in this particular site, helped us with the book, claims it's between 12 and 20% larger than a standard human jaw at that time. And this idea of cannibalism has been a big issue. Um, but in 1924, the, some excavations were done, and they found that human, they found bones and human marrow had been extracted from it, which probably suggests cannibalism during a famine. So there are some other interesting stories about Lovelock Cave. Another skull, for instance, was unearthed in 1967, a few miles south of here. This had very robust sort of Cro-Magnon type features. And anthropologist Eric K. Reed of Utah University said the skull is large, that was his quote. He made close comparisons to previously discovered skulls from the Southwest and determined that it was probably much older than 8,000 years old. Notably strong brow ridge, strong nuchal crest, retreating forehead, massive occipital, occipital torus and crest. It was classed among the early people Central California material, which have these robust features. And strangely, you get a lot of these in Neanderthal type skulls, but not many in modern type skulls. And the skull is very similar to what we found at Spirit Cave as well. Also in Lovelock Cave, it's quite famous here, are the sandals. These are huge sandals made from different uh, plant fibers, 
One was over 15 inches long and uh, apparently it's in the, the museum in Reno, which we're gonna check out. One of the stories I read about, about the so-called um, Saiti Carl, the giants who lived here, was that they would actually, before they started living in caves and they were forced into the caves by the Paiutes and other tribes, they used to actually send the dead out onto boats, on reed boats, into the middle of the lake, put rocks on it, set it on fire, and it would sink to the bottom of the lake. And so often, you know, in recent years, in the last century or so, they found piles of bones and rocks and artifacts just in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of where the lake once stood. So that's quite an interesting thing because that goes against the idea that they would just eat everybody. You know, there could be more to this than meets the eye. And even Clarence Stoker, who was one of the people who were kind of reporting on this in the 50s and 60s and making discoveries, he thinks they came from Egypt. And this is like a really interesting twist, whether he was just a bit out there, you know, given different ideas, or whether he genuinely thought that because of, you know, certain traits they had. That is really intriguing in itself. But how on earth would they get here potentially 10 to 15,000 years ago before Egyptian civilization ever really existed? But I like the idea, this is growing on me, that of American Genesis, where these, these people here could be related to the Denisovans. There could be Denisovan DNA if tests were allowed. Um, it could be that they were the first, earliest inhabitants of North America, going back hundreds of thousands of years, millions even. And these were the, the people of tradition who existed with the megafauna. And there's different stories that Vine Deloria Jr. and Ross Hamilton have shared with me, which we feature in the book, which talk about this. They were herding mammoths like we herd cattle. They were 14 feet tall and so on and so forth. But anyway, you know, we have to kind of really rethink what's going on here. Um, we've got dating that, you know, with skulls that could go back to 9,000 years. But of course, we had the Winnemucca petroglyphs next to Pyramid Lake, which is slightly further west from here, which, you know, is part of the same whole Humboldt Lake region. And, uh, you know, the same people who were living here, which date to 14,800 years old, potentially. And these petroglyphs then suggest that there was a time when before the Younger Dryas happened, you know, so we're looking at, you know, an extreme antiquity, older than Gebekli Tepe in Southeast Turkey, here in North America, creating amazing petroglyphs, surviving, you know, and like being quite sophisticated with their technologies, their duck decoys, their sandals, their different fishing gear and so on. So we have to really question who these people really were. And I think more evidence is coming out, but we have the Smithsonian disappearing, all the skulls and the bones and the skeletons. And we have the, the local tribes, which I fully respect their decisions to repatriate um, the bones and the burial goods, but it's not enabling the truth about the prehistory of North America to come forth. But hopefully it will soon. And it's discoveries like this cave and everything that was found in it, which are slowly rewriting the history of North America and of the giants.